Hello again, Econ 160, and welcome to another video lecture. Today we're going to be talking about consumer and producer surplus. So in the last couple of lectures, we've been diving deep into how markets function through the forces of supply and demand. And we learned that competitive markets allocate goods efficiently because of the price mechanism. So in this lecture, we're going to ask whether we can quantify the degree to which markets are making consumers and producers better off. And we're going to measure that with these two concepts known as consumer and producer surplus. So by figuring out this way to measure how much market participants are being made better off by the market, that also then allows us to quantify how much they get made worse off when markets aren't allowed to function properly. Okay. And so this idea that disruptions to the market can make people worse off and how we measure that is going to be an important tool for policy analysis and we'll be making use of it frequently throughout the course. And the Frenchman you see here, his name is Jules Dupuis. He was actually an engineer from the 19th century and he was one of the first people to use the ideas of consumer surplus that we're going to see today. And he was using it in the context of estimating the benefits of public works projects such as new roadways. So here are our learning outcomes for today. By mastering this lesson, you should be able to explain the meaning of consumer and producer surplus and explain why they measure the degree to which consumers and producers are made better off by trading in the market. Second, you should be able to calculate consumer and producer surplus, both in market equilibrium and at any price or quantity level. Third, you should be able to explain what price floors and price ceilings are and identify examples of them in real life. Fourth, you should be able to explain the meaning of deadweight loss. And finally, you should be able to calculate the excess demand or excess supply that results from price uh, floors or price ceilings and calculate the deadweight loss that results from them. So let's start by explaining the concept of consumer surplus. The definition of consumer surplus is that it's a dollar denominated measure of how much consumers are made better off by trading in the market versus not trading in the market. Okay, and we're going to start explaining how to calculate consumer surplus using a simple example. So there's this consumer in the market for coffee called Charlie, and he has his own personal marginal benefit schedule over the cups of coffee that he can choose to consume. And we're going to ask, what is Charlie's consumer surplus from participating in the market for coffee when the price of coffee is $3? And we're going to calculate Charlie's consumer surplus in three steps. First, we're going to ask how many cups of coffee Charlie's going to buy when the price is $3. Second, we're going to ask what is his marginal utility, meaning his marginal benefit minus marginal cost, uh, for each cup of coffee that he gets. And finally, what is the total utility that he gets by purchasing all those cups? Okay, so let's start by asking question number one. How many cups of coffee will Charlie buy if the price is $3? To answer this question, we can use the principle of utility maximization, which says that utility is maximized when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And the main point to remember here is that from Charlie's perspective, because the price of a cup of coffee is $3, his marginal cost for each cup of coffee purchased is just $3, right? He's just paying out $3 for each cup he wants to purchase. So using marginal benefit equals marginal cost, he's going to purchase up to the point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So he's going to buy up to the point where marginal benefit is $3, which means he'll buy four cups. Okay, so our answer for question one is Charlie will buy four cups when the price is $3. Now moving on to question two. What is the marginal utility that Charlie gets for each of these cups of coffee that he purchases? So to answer this, let's uh, expand the table a bit. All right, and so now we're going to have some extra columns. We're going to fill out for each cup of coffee what Charlie's marginal cost is, which remember from his perspective is just the price. 
And then with that, we can write down the marginal utility he gets from each cup, which is simply marginal benefit minus marginal cost, okay? Uh, so let's fill out Charlie's marginal costs. Uh, since from Charlie's perspective, he's just paying the price for each cup purchased, his marginal cost is going to be $3 for every cup, okay? Now let's write down his marginal utilities. So for the first cup, his marginal benefit is 6, and his marginal cost is 3, and so his marginal utility will be 3. For the second cup, his marginal benefit is 5, his marginal cost is 3, and so his marginal utility will be 2. For the third cup, his marginal benefit is 4, his marginal cost is 3, and so his marginal utility is 1. For the fourth cup, his marginal benefit is 3, his marginal cost is 3, so the marginal utility is 0. And finally, we can do it for the fifth cup too. Uh, even though Charlie doesn't actually buy a fifth cup, if he were to buy a fifth cup, the marginal benefit would be 2, and the marginal cost would be 3, and so the marginal utility would be minus 1, right? And that's why he doesn't buy the fifth cup, because he actually starts to lose utility on the fifth cup, right? And now the last step, question 3. What is the total utility gained by purchasing these four cups of coffee? To do that, uh, we can simply calculate total utility by adding up the marginal utilities of each cup, right? Um, so if he purchased zero cups, his total utility would simply be zero. When he purchases the first cup, he adds $3 of marginal utility to his total utility, so he has three total utility. When he purchases the second cup, he adds two utility. Okay, so now his total utility is five. When he purchases the third cup, he adds one utility, and so his total utility becomes six. And finally, when he purchases his fourth cup, he adds zero utility for the fourth cup, and so his total utility stays at six, all right? And so we can say that the total utility that Charlie gets uh, from participating in the market is $6 worth of utility. And so we can conclude that the consumer surplus that Charlie gets from the market is equal to $6. All right, so that's how we calculate consumer surplus in this simple example. Okay, so that example illustrated how we can calculate consumer surplus for a single consumer at a given price. And it basically involved adding up the marginal benefit minus the price up to the number of units that were purchased. And because of that uh, interpretation of consumer surplus, there's a simple way to do the calculation graphically, as long as you know the consumer's individual demand or marginal benefits curve. So let me show you how to do that in the same example as in the previous slide. So here's Charlie's marginal benefit schedule. It's the same thing that we did previously. And we're going to use this data to calculate his consumer surplus a second time when the price is $3. But this time, we're going to do it graphically. So to do this, the first thing we want to do is uh, draw the marginal benefits curve, or the demand curve. And so let's do that. At one cup of coffee, the marginal benefit is 6. At two cups of coffee, the marginal benefit is 5. At three cups, it's four. At four cups, it's three. And at five cups, is two. All right, so here's Charlie's uh, marginal benefit schedule uh, slash demand curve, okay? Then we're gonna draw the price on the graph. Okay, the price is just a straight line at $3. So the price is $3. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add up uh, the difference between marginal benefit and price up to the quantity consumed, right? At a price of $3, Charlie is going to consume four units. And so we're going to add up these distances here. And we can represent these distances by these bars, right? Each bar represents the difference between the marginal benefit minus the price. So for the first unit, uh, the bar is $6 minus $3. For the second unit, the bar is $5 minus $3. And for the third unit, it's $4 minus $3. And of course, for the fourth unit, uh, the marginal benefit was equal to the price, so the size of the bar is zero, right? But basically, if we add up the area of these bars, we end up with $6, which is exactly the consumer surplus that we calculated on the last slide. So that was how to calculate consumer surplus graphically for a single consumer. And for a market as a whole, it's much the same thing. We simply want to add up 
the marginal benefit minus the price uh, for the consumers up to the amount that consumers are purchasing. Right? And since the marginal benefits curve uh, is the same thing as the demand curve, this just amounts to adding up the bars, which are beneath the demand curve and above the price. right? And the difference in a market compared to with individual consumers is simply there is just a lot more bars to add up. Since you now have a lot of consumers consuming a large number of units together, rather than a single consumer consuming a small number of units. And so you may have noticed that the bars in the previous slide looked suspiciously like a triangle. And because of that, consumer surplus can actually be pretty well approximated by calculating the area of the triangle, which is beneath the demand curve and above the price. Okay, because by doing that, you're basically adding up marginal benefit minus price, okay, up to the quantity consumed. And so the area of consumer surplus would look like this in a market. And so let's do this example numerically. What's the consumer surplus in the market that's being represented by this graph? To do that, we simply have to calculate the area of this triangle. Okay, so if you'll remember from uh, basic geometry, the area of a triangle is equal to one half times its base times its height. Okay, and so the base of this triangle runs from zero to 250, so the base is 250, and the height runs from 5 to 10, so the height is 5. And so the area of the triangle is 1 half times 250 times 5. And if you plug that into a calculator or just do it in your head, you get that the area of the triangle is 625. And so we can say that the consumer surplus in this market is equal to $625. All right, so consumers by participating in this market when the price is $5, are $625 better off as a whole than if they didn't participate in the market. Now let's talk about producer surplus. The definition of producer surplus is that it's a dollar denominated measure of how much producers in the market are made better off by trading in the market versus not trading in the market. Okay. And since producers are typically profit-driven, producer surplus can be thought of as a measure of the producer's variable profits by participating in the market. And we'll talk more about variable profits in a later lecture. But for now, let's start with another simple example. So there's this producer in the market for coffee. We'll call it Star Beans. And here, Star Beans' marginal cost schedule uh, for producing coffee. And what we're going to ask is, what is Starbeans producer surplus when the price of coffee is $4? So we'll start with the same three steps as we did with consumer surplus. First, we're going to ask, how many cups of coffee will Starbeans produce if the price is $4? Then we're going to ask, what is the marginal profit, meaning marginal revenue minus marginal cost, that Starbeans gets for each of those cups? And finally, we'll ask, what is the total profit that Starbeans gains by producing these cups of coffee? So to the first question, how many cups of coffee will Starbeans produce if the price is $4? Uh, the thing you want to remember here is that a firm's profits are maximized when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. This is simply an application of the utility maximization principle, uh, but as applied to profits rather than utility, right? And so uh, from the perspective of star beans, when the price is $4, their marginal revenue, uh, meaning the additional revenue they get from each cup of coffee sold, is just the price at $4, right? They get $4 for every cup of coffee sold. And so based on the principle of maximization, they are going to produce up to the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so they're going to produce four cups of coffee, right? Because that's where marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue of $4. All right, so star beans at $4 will produce four cups of coffee. And now to the second question, what is the marginal profit that star beans earns for each of these cups of coffee? So to do that, let's expand the table. We're going to fill out star beans marginal revenue for each cup of coffee produced, which is simply going to be equal to the price. And then we're going to fill out Starbeans' marginal profit from each cup of coffee produced. 
right? Since the marginal revenue is just the price, it's equal to $4 at every cut. How about the uh, marginal profit? Okay, so if he produces one cup, then Starbean's revenue is $4 for that cup, and $1 is the cost, and so the marginal profit is $3. For the second cup, the marginal revenue is $4, and the marginal cost is $2, and so the marginal profit is 2 For the third cup, the marginal revenue is $4, and the marginal cost is $3, and so the marginal profit is 1 For the fourth cup, the marginal revenue is $4, and the marginal cost is $4, and so the marginal profit is zero. Okay, and for the fifth cup, Star Beans doesn't actually produce five cups, but if it were to produce the fifth cup, the marginal revenue would be four dollars for that fifth cup, but the marginal cost would be five, and so the marginal profit for the fifth cup would actually be minus one, right? And so that's why Star Beans does not produce the fifth cup. All right, so now let's answer the third question. What is the total profit gained by producing these cups? And so to do that, we'll simply add up the marginal profits to give us the total profit up to the number of cups produced. All right, so if Star Beans produces zero cups, then clearly the total profit is zero. If Star Beans produces one cup, then the marginal profit added is $3, and so the total profit is $3 at one cup. If it then produces the second cup, the marginal profit is $2, so we add $2 to the total profit for a total profit of five. For the third cup, the marginal profit is $1, and so we add $1 to the total profit, giving us a total profit of six. For the fourth cup, the marginal profit is zero, and so the total profit stays at six. All right, and so the total profit that Star Beans gains by producing four cups is $6, all right? And so what we can say is that Star Beans producer surplus for participating in the market when the price of coffee is $4, is equal to six dollars. Okay, so that example illustrated how we can calculate producer surplus uh, for a single producer at a given market price. And it basically involved adding up price minus marginal cost up to the number of units sold. And because of that, uh, there's also a simple way to do the same calculation graphically as long as you know the producer's individual supply curve or marginal cost curve. Uh, so let's do that for the same example as the previous slide. Here is Star Beans marginal cost schedule. The first step is to draw the marginal cost slash supply curve. So at a quantity of one, marginal cost is one dollar. At a quantity of two, marginal cost is two dollars. At a quantity of three, marginal cost is three dollars. At a quantity of four, it's four dollars, and so on. And so here is the marginal cost slash supply curve for star beans. The second step is to draw the price. Uh, the price is just going to be a straight line here at four dollars, okay? And then we're going to be adding up the differences between the price and the marginal cost, and we can represent that with these bars here, right? And so for the first unit, the price minus the marginal cost is four minus one. For the second unit, the price minus the marginal cost is four minus two. For the third unit, the price minus marginal cost is four minus three. And for the fourth unit, the price minus marginal cost is just zero, right? So the size of the bar is zero. And then if we add up the areas of the bars, then we get that the producer surplus is $6, just like we did in the previous slide. All right, so that was how to calculate producer surplus graphically for a single producer. And for a market, it's much the same thing. We just want to add up the producer's price minus marginal cost up to the amount that producers are actually uh, selling, right? And since the marginal cost curve is equal to the supply curve, this simply amounts to adding up the bars that are underneath the price and above the supply curve, right? The main difference in a market compared to individual producers is that there's simply just gonna be a lot more bars to add up, right? Since you have many producers producing a large number of units altogether, rather than a single producer producing a small number of units. And so you may have noticed again that the bars in the previous slide look a lot like a triangle. And so a good way to calculate producer surplus 
is simply by calculating the area of the triangle that is beneath the market price and above the supply curve, like this, all right? And so let's do an example. What's the producer surplus in the market given by this diagram? Remember the area of a triangle is one half times its base times its height. The base runs from zero to 200, so the base is 200. The height runs from one to five, and so the height is four. And so the area is one half times 200 times four. Okay, and that gives us 400. So producer surplus in this market is $400. And that means that the producers as a whole in this market are $400 better off by participating in the market versus not. Now that we know how to calculate consumer and producer surplus, we can easily calculate both in a market equilibrium. All right, so this diagram is showing us supply and demand in a market. Let's go ahead and calculate consumer and producer surplus in this market. The first thing to do is to find out what price the market is going to be trading at. And so that happens at the equilibrium, which gives us a price of $6. Okay. And at that price, the quantity uh, consumed and produced is going to be 60. Consumer surplus is going to be this blue triangle right here, which is beneath the demand curve and above the price. And producer surplus is going to be this red triangle right here, which is beneath the price and above the supply curve. All right, so consumer surplus is the area of the blue triangle, which is 1 half times the base of 60 times the height of 6, which is 180. Producer surplus is 1 half times the base of 60 times the height of 3, which gives us 90. And finally, we can calculate what's called total surplus. Total surplus is simply the measure of how much better off all the market participants are as a whole, so including both the consumers and the producers. And if there are only these consumers and producers in the market, then total surplus is simply equal to consumer surplus plus producer surplus. And so we simply add up 180 plus 90, and we get that total surplus in this market is 270. All right, and so we can say that the market participants as a whole are $270 better off by trading in the market versus not trading in the market. Now that we know how to calculate consumer, producer, and total surplus, we are ready to apply what we learned to analyze the welfare consequences of market distortions. And so this is going to be our first example of applied policy analysis using all of the tools that we've learned up until now. And the distortion that we're going to be focusing on today is government price controls. All right. So a government price control is just any restriction on the price at which trades in the markets can take place. And we're going to consider two different types of price controls, price ceilings and price floors. A price ceiling says that trades in the market cannot be made above a certain price. And an example of a price ceiling in real life uh, is rent control in the housing market. Rent control says that landlords cannot charge tenants rent exceeding a specified amount, uh, usually tied to some base price that the government determines as fair. And so because landlords cannot charge above that amount, uh, it's a price ceiling. Now, the purpose of a price ceiling is usually to transfer surplus okay, from producers to consumers by forcing prices lower. So in rent control, for example, the idea is to transfer surplus from landlords, right, the uh, suppliers of housing, to tenants, the consumers of housing, by keeping rents down. Okay, so what does a price ceiling do to a market? So here's a diagram which represents a market. Here's the demand curve, and here's the supply curve, and then there's a price ceiling at $3. So this says that trades in the market can't happen at a price above $3, all right? And so you can actually think of um, shading out the entire portion of the market, which is above the price ceiling, because the market's not allowed to go there, right? It's not allowed to trade above $3. So the first thing that the price ceiling does is that it forces the market to trade at $3, rather than $5, which is where it, it would want to go in equilibrium. So the first thing is that the market wants to trade at 5, but because it's not allowed to go up there, 
the price ceiling forces the market to trade at a lower price of three dollars. But what happens when there's three dollars? Uh, when three dollars is the price? Well, the demand at three dollars is higher than the supply, right? And so there's going to be an excess demand of 40 units. How do we know this? We simply note that uh, at the price ceiling of $3, the quantity demanded is 70, and the quantity supplied is 30. And so the difference is the excess demand, and that's 40 units. Okay. So the first thing that the price ceiling does is that uh, it forces the price away from the equilibrium down to the ceiling. And second, that causes excess demand. All right, one thing to always keep in mind is that the price ceiling is only going to matter if the equilibrium price is above the price ceiling, right? It's only going to matter if the market wants to trade above the price ceiling. If the equilibrium price is below the price ceiling, like in this example, right, uh, then the market's just going to trade at the market price, right, because it's lower than the ceiling. You can think about shading out uh, the portion of the market which is above the ceiling, but in this example, the equilibrium is below the ceiling, and so the ceiling doesn't actually affect the market, right? And so when the equilibrium price is lower than the price ceiling, then we say that the price ceiling is non-binding, all right? And so that means it doesn't actually affect what's going on in the market, okay? At least right now, a non-binding price ceiling might still become binding later in the future if supply or demand changes, right? Uh, so if these change and the new equilibrium becomes above the ceiling, then the price ceiling is going to matter again. So that's something just to keep in mind, that um, a price ceiling may or may not have an effect depending on where it is relative to the market's equilibrium. Okay, now let's talk about price floors. A price floor says that trades in the market cannot happen below a certain price. Okay. And so an example of a price floor in real life is minimum wage in the labor market, right? Minimum wage says that employers cannot pay workers wages below a specified amount, right? So it's putting floor on the price in the labor market, so it's a price floor. And the purpose of a price floor is usually to transfer surplus from consumers to producers by forcing the price higher, All right? So we can think of minimum wage the purpose of minimum wage is to transfer surplus from the consumers of labor, which are firms, to the producers of labor, which are workers, uh, by forcing the workers' wages higher. All right. So what is the effect of a price floor on a market? Uh, this diagram shows an example of a market. We have our demand curve, supply curve, and this time we have a price floor instead of a price ceiling. And because it's a floor, we actually want to shade out what's beneath it, right? Uh, the market's not allowed to trade at prices that are beneath the price floor. And so we can see that the equilibrium of the market is actually at $5, so the market wants to trade at $5, but this price floor of $7 says, nope, you can't go there, and so it forces the price in the market to be seven instead of five. And so the first thing is that it changes the price that trades happen at. The market wants to trade at $5 in this example, but the price floor forces it to trade at $7. Okay, and then if we look at $7, we see that the quantity supplied is uh, 35 and the quantity demanded is 15. And so there's actually an excess supply now of 20 units, right? 35 want to be supplied and 15 want to be demanded. And so we have an excess supply of 20 units, All right? So a binding price floor is going to force the market to trade at a price which is higher than the equilibrium price, and then it's going to create an excess supply in the market. Okay, and we should always remember that price floors are only going to matter if uh, the equilibrium price is actually below the floor, right? If the equilibrium price is above the floor, then the market is just going to trade at the equilibrium price. Uh, so this example shows a market where the price floor is below the equilibrium. And because the price floor only forbids prices which are beneath the floor, since the equilibrium price is above the floor, uh, the market has no problem trading at that price. Okay, and so we say that this floor is non-binding. All right, and just as with non-binding ceilings, 
um, a price floor that is non-binding right now might still become binding in the future, right, if supply and demand change. So always keep that in mind. Okay, so we learned that the purpose of a price control is usually to transfer surplus from one group of market participants to the other, right? A price ceiling is meant to transfer surplus from producers to consumers, and a price floor is meant to transfer surplus from consumers to producers. But we also saw that price controls can force the market out of equilibrium and create excess supply or excess demand. And so the question we're going to ask now is, what are the net implications of price controls for the participants in the market? Do the intended beneficiaries of the price control uh, always benefit, and by how much? And at what cost to the other side of the market? And particularly, we're going to be interested in, do the gains to one side of the market outweigh the cost to the other side? Okay, and to answer this question, we can proceed in three steps. The first step is simply to calculate consumer and producer surplus without the price ceiling. So just calculate CS and PS in the normal market equilibrium when there's no uh, government interference. The second step is to calculate consumer and producer surplus with the price ceiling. All right. And then finally, we simply compare uh, CS and PS with and without the price ceiling. And then we'll be able to say something about who gains and who loses from the price ceiling and by how much. OK, step one. Calculate consumer and producer surplus without the price ceiling. So let's get rid of the price ceiling and replace it with the equilibrium price. Consumer surplus is going to be the triangle, which is below the demand curve and above the equilibrium price. Producer surplus is going to be the triangle, which is below the equilibrium price and above the supply curve. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and calculate the areas of these triangles. For consumer surplus, the base is 50 and the height is 5. And so consumer surplus is 1 half times 50 times 5, which is 125. Producer surplus, the base of the triangle is 50 and the height is also 5. So the producer surplus is 1 half times 50 times 5, which is 125. All right. And so the total surplus then is consumer surplus plus producer surplus, and it's 250. All right, simple. Now let's move on to step two, calculate consumer and producer surplus with the price ceiling. All right, and let's start with producer surplus first. So remember, to calculate producer surplus, what we want to be doing is we want to add up price minus marginal cost up to the amount which is produced, right? And so at the price ceiling, how much is actually going to be produced? Well, only 30 units are going to be produced, right? Because the supply curve says the quantity supplied is only going to be 30. So we want to add up the price minus the marginal cost up to the number of units produced, which is 30. And so that's this triangle here. And so producer surplus is 1 half times the base, which is 30, times the height, which is 3. And that gives us 45 for the producer surplus. All right, so now let's calculate consumer surplus. Now, this is actually going to be a little trickier, okay, because with consumer surplus, it's not actually this triangle here, and it's not that triangle because uh, 70 units don't actually get consumed, right? Um, because there's only 30 units which are being produced, only 30 units ultimately get traded. So we only want to add up the marginal benefit minus the price up until the number of units which are actually traded, which is 30. And so the area representing consumer surplus is actually now a trapezoid and not a triangle, right? Because we're adding up the marginal benefit minus the price, but only up to 30 units, which is the amount that actually gets traded in the market. All right, so how do we calculate the area of a trapezoid? The area of a trapezoid is equal to 1 half times the sum of its two parallel lengths, okay, so length one and length two, and then multiply by its width, all right, which is the distance between its parallel lengths. Okay, uh, in this course, you don't have to memorize a lot of equations, um, but this is one of them that would be very helpful to memorize, all right? And so let's uh, calculate the area of the trapezoid now. 
All right, so the first length over here, okay, it runs from three to seven, and so the first length is four, so L1 is four. The second length runs from three to 10, and so that length is seven. All right, and the width of the trapezoid goes from zero to 30, so it's 30, and so our consumer surplus is one half times four plus seven times 30, which if you uh, calculate that, it's equal to 165, okay? So now we have our producer surplus, which is 45, and our consumer surplus, which is 165. And if we add them together, we get a total surplus of 210. And so now let's compare our results with and without the price ceiling. Without the price ceiling, we calculated that consumer surplus was 125, producer surplus was 125, and total surplus was 250. With the price ceiling, we calculated that consumer surplus was 165, producer surplus was 45, and total surplus was 210. All right, and so the price ceiling caused consumers to gain $40 of surplus, the producers lost $80 of surplus, and the market participants as a whole therefore lost $40 of surplus altogether. So what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is that this price ceiling was indeed successful at transferring okay, surplus from producers to consumers, but unfortunately the gain of the consumers was actually outweighed by the cost of the producers resulting in an overall loss of total surplus, okay? And this loss in total surplus caused by a market distortion is what's called deadweight loss. And um, we're actually going to see that binding price controls are always going to result in a deadweight loss, all right? So although a price control can transfer surplus from one side of the market to the other, it does always result in a loss of total surplus known as deadweight loss. Now, interestingly, there's also a graphical representation of deadweight loss. And so you can actually calculate deadweight loss directly by looking at the graph. And to see that, uh, let's go back to um, the market without a price ceiling. And this was our consumer surplus and our producer surplus when there was no price ceiling. And then let's go to our market with the price ceiling. This was our consumer surplus and producer surplus with the price ceiling. And so now if you compare the total surpluses between the two cases, all right, uh, without price ceiling, with price ceiling, without price ceiling, with price ceiling, you can see that the difference is this small purple triangle right here, okay? And that's the loss in total surplus which resulted from the price ceiling. And so this triangle here represents our deadweight loss. In fact, there's a very uh, reasonable interpretation for why deadweight loss is this triangle. Because think of it this way. Um, without the price ceiling, the quantity which would be traded in the market is 50, right? With the price ceiling, the quantity that's traded goes down to 30. And so there are 20 units of lost trades in here, right? Uh, these additional 20 units no longer get traded uh, after the price ceiling is put into place. And if you add up the distance between the demand curve and the supply curve for each of these lost trades, what you're really adding up is the marginal benefit minus the marginal cost to the producers for each of these trades, right? And since marginal benefit minus the marginal cost is sort of the net surplus between the consumers and the producers, adding up the MB minus the MC for those lost trades gives us uh, the deadweight loss which is the surplus that would have happened in the market equilibrium, but no longer happens because of the price control, all right? And so to calculate the size of the deadweight loss directly using the graph, we simply have to calculate the area of this triangle, all right? The base of the triangle runs from 30 to 50, so that's a width of 20, and the height of the triangle runs from three to seven, so that's a height of four. And so the deadweight loss is 1 half times 20 times 4, which gives us 40, all right? And so there's a deadweight loss of $40, which is exactly the same as we calculated previously. Okay, now let's do another example. This time we're going to be conducting a welfare analysis of a price floor. 
we're going to be following the same three steps. First, we're going to calculate consumer and producer surplus without the price floor. Second, we're going to calculate consumer and, sur uh, and producer surplus with the price floor. And then we're going to compare and see who gains and who loses. All right. And this is the market and the price floor with which we're going to be considering. All right, step one is to calculate consumer and producer surplus without the price floor. Uh, so let's get rid of the price floor here and put in the equilibrium price, okay, in the market. Uh, the upper triangle is gonna be consumer surplus and the lower triangle is gonna be producer surplus. All right, consumer surplus has a base of 80 and a height of two. And so the consumer surplus is 1 half times 80 times 2, which is 80. Producer surplus has a base of 80 and a height of 8. And so producer surplus is 1 half times 80 times 8, which is 320. And so total surplus we get by adding those two numbers up, and we get a total surplus of 400. Okay, step two is to calculate consumer and producer surplus with the price floor. Uh, so let's start by calculating consumer surplus, and to do that we're going to be adding up the marginal benefit minus the price up to the amount consumed, right? And at the price floor, how much is being consumed? Uh, 40 units are being consumed, and so we're going to be adding up uh, marginal benefit minus price up to 40 units, and so that's the area of this triangle over here. And what is that? The base is 40 and the height is 1. And so our consumer surplus is 1 half times 40 times 1, which is 20. Now let's do producer surplus. To do producer surplus, we're going to add up the price minus the marginal cost, right? Again, only up to the amount of the units actually traded, right? And so even though producers want to produce 90 at the price floor of $9, they're not actually going to produce 90, right? Um, because they're not able to sell 90 units. They're only able to sell 40 units, right? And they're not going to produce more than they're able to sell. And so the quantity that actually gets traded is 40. And so we want to add up price minus marginal cost only up to 40 units. And so that's given by this trapezoid over here, all right? And so now let's calculate the area of the producer surplus. Again, the area of a trapezoid is one half times the sum of its two parallel lengths times the width, all right? Uh, the first length uh, runs from four to nine, and so that's five. The second length runs from zero to nine, and so that's nine. And the width runs from zero to 40, and so it's 40. And so we have that producer surplus is one half times five plus nine times 40, which gives us 280, all right? And so then if we add up CS and PS, we get our total surplus, which is 300. So putting it all together, without the price floor, we calculated that consumer surplus was 80, producer surplus was 320, and total surplus was 400. With the price floor, we found that consumer surplus was 20, producer surplus was 280, and total surplus was 300. Okay, and so what was the change? Consumers lost $60 in surplus uh, because of the price floor. Producers lost $40 of surplus because of the price floor. And the dip, uh, for the market participants as a whole, they lost $100 in surplus overall. So what's our conclusion here? Our conclusion for this example is that this price floor actually was not successful in its intended purpose of transferring surplus from consumers to producers, right? In fact, it actually harmed both the consumers and the producers. And so the lesson here is that it's actually possible for price controls to actually harm those people that it was intended to help. And why does that happen? That can happen when the price control um, results in a very large decrease in the quantity traded, right? And so for a price ceiling, the intended benefits that uh, you're trying to give to the consumers through a lower price can be offset by a decrease in the quantity actually consumed, right? The reduction in the size of the market is large enough to offset the gains of the consumers. 
And for a price floor, the intended benefits that you're trying to give producers through higher prices can also be offset by a decrease in the quantity sold, right? So although um, they get to sell at higher prices, the amount by which uh, the quantity decreases more than offsets that benefit, okay? So that's the key thing to remember. Um, price controls can sometimes successfully transfer surplus from one side of the market to the other, but not always. And it's actually possible for a price control to hurt both sides of the market. And finally, let's just do a quick graphical calculation of deadweight loss for this example. Uh, deadweight loss is going to be given by adding up the marginal benefit minus the marginal cost for all the lost trades. And so that's this triangle over here. What's the area? Uh, the base is 40 because uh, it's running from 40 to 80, right? So the base is 40 and the height runs from 4 to 9, so it's 5. So the area is 1 half times 40 times 5, which gives us 100, which is the same answer that we got in the previous slide. All right, let's finish the lecture by talking about some practical considerations for price controls in real life. Uh, first of all, because price controls always cause some deadweight loss, uh, and they might not even benefit the side of the market that they're intended to help, uh, as we showed in our example, Economists, generally speaking, are not very supportive of the use of price controls. However, okay, there is a catch. Uh, the size of the deadweight loss and the degree to which surplus can be transferred actually depends on the elasticity of the supply and demand curves. Okay? And so it is possible, practically speaking, that in certain markets, price controls can potentially successfully achieve a transfer of surplus without a significant cost in terms of deadweight loss. And so let me now show you why that is. So let's start by considering two markets, one with a fairly elastic supply curve, all right, so here's an elastic supply curve, and one with a very inelastic supply curve, okay, so here's our inelastic supply curve. And uh, just for the sake of comparison, let's assume that they both currently trade at the same uh, equilibrium price, okay? And now we're going to ask what happens when you put in a price ceiling, okay? And so it's the same price ceiling for both markets. Now the deadweight loss that's caused in the market with the elastic supply curve, we get that by adding up uh, the marginal benefit minus the marginal cost for the lost trades, and so that's this triangle over here. And then same thing for the market with the inelastic demand curve, all right, and the lost trades are much smaller, and so you only get this small triangle here, right? And so as you can see, the deadweight loss in the market with the very elastic supply curve is a lot larger because you had a much greater reduction in the quantity traded, whereas in the market with the inelastic supply curve, you didn't have as much of a reduction in the quantity, okay? And so our conclusion is that elasticity plays a very crucial role in any sort of public policy debate about price controls. And so let's take the debate over rent control for an example. Uh, advocates of rent control might argue that the supply curve of housing is very inelastic, right, meaning not price sensitive. And if the supply curve is inelastic, then that means rent control will not result in much deadweight loss in the housing market, but it's still going to be able to transfer surplus from the producers, aka the landlords, to the consumers, aka the tenants, through lower rents. Okay, but opponents of rent control would argue the opposite, right? They would argue that the supply curve of housing is actually more elastic than you might think, uh, especially in the long run. They would argue that rent control discourages developers from building more housing, uh, and that it might also reduce the incentives of landlords to maintain the condition of their rental properties uh, which results in a loss of quality over time, okay? And so as you can see, uh, debates about price controls often boil down to people's views on the elasticity of the supply and demand curves in a market. Let's do one more example. This time we're going to be comparing the effect of a price floor in a market with an elastic demand curve versus a market with an inelastic demand curve. Right, so here's our elastic demand curve, 
and here's our very inelastic demand curve. And again, for the sake of comparison, we're going to assume that both markets are currently trading at the same price. And then we put in a binding price floor, the same price floor for both markets. The deadweight loss in market A is equal to this triangle over here. And the deadweight loss in market B is equal to this small triangle over here. And so as you can see, in the market with the elastic demand curve, the deadweight loss is a lot higher because you have a much larger drop in the quantity of trade. Whereas in the market with the inelastic demand curve, you had a very small drop in the quantity of trade and therefore a correspondingly small deadweight loss. And so again, uh, we see that elasticity plays a crucial role in debates over price controls. And so now let's talk about the debate over a very important price control in real life, which is the minimum wage. And opponents of minimum wage would argue that the demand for low-skilled workers is pretty elastic, right? And what that means is that increasing the minimum wage would result in a large drop in employment, right? As uh, employers stop employing or employ fewer minimum wage workers, and that results in a large deadweight loss. Okay, proponents of minimum wage might argue that labor demand is actually very inelastic, and thus a higher minimum wage would uh, successfully transfer surplus from the labor demanders. Uh, which are firms, to the labor producers, which are workers, and result only in a small deadweight loss. Okay, so again, um, a lot of the debate boils down to your view on the elasticity of the labor demand curve. Now, ultimately, um, as you can see, debates over price controls uh, cannot be resolved with theory alone, right? Because the relevant elasticities which then determine the size of the deadweight loss and the size of the surplus transfers are empirical questions that require data to answer. So we need more than just theory, we also need some data. Um, but even more than that, the degree of deadweight loss that a person would consider acceptable in order to achieve a certain size of transfer, and even whether or not a government uh, really has the right to be involved in these kinds of transfers, uh, these are normative questions, right, that depend as much on your philosophical and moral commitments as it does on your views on uh, empirical questions or economic theory, right? Um, so, yeah, again, debates over price controls uh, can't be resolved with just theory alone. They also require empirical work, but they also boil down to uh, your own perspectives on the role of government and the relative trade-off between deadweight loss and transfers. All right, that's it for today's lecture. Thank you for sticking around to the end. Here's a quick review. We learned that consumer and producer surplus are dollar measures of how much consumers and producers are made better off by participating in the market. We learned that consumer and producer surplus depends on what the price level is and how much is being traded. We saw that consumer surplus is calculated by the area which is underneath the demand curve and above the price up to the quantity consumed. And similarly, producer surplus is calculated as the area which is underneath the price and above the supply curve, again, up to the quantity which is produced. Total surplus is equal to consumer surplus plus producer surplus. And deadweight loss is the loss in total surplus which results from a distortion in the market such as a price control. We learn about price controls, in particular price ceilings and price floors, and what they are, and we learn how to calculate deadweight loss due to price controls, and we learn how they uh, the size of the deadweight loss depends on the market's supply and demand elasticities. All right, so that's it for today's lecture. Uh, next time we're gonna be talking about taxation, and we're gonna be using all of our tools to analyze that very important market distortion uh, that happens in real life called taxation. See you guys next time.